Hello and welcome back once again to the HR Social Hour Half Hour Podcast. This is episode 91. John and Wendy talk to Sabrina Baker. I'm your host, John. And I'm Wendy. How are you, John? Wendy, I'm well. It is, uh, we're into the 90s now. Uh, wow. And that's exciting. Yes, And it is. it's also exciting. This episode is coming out right before the November chat. Yes. I'm having a hard time believing it's already November, I'll be honest, because I'm not quite sure what happened to summer. Still kind of in that mode, but i um, so excited that we are going to be uh, chatting about employee recognition with our friends from Bonusly. Really excited to be able to do that. Yes, yes. Uh, we've been talking to Ben with Bonusly since, uh, wow, I guess Sherm uh, yeah. this summer. We had a chance to meet. We we met the Gratitude Shrub, one of my yeah. favorite <laughs> things that anybody had at the conference. But awesome. uh, really, yeah, Bonusly is doing some great stuff in that world. And, and we had the opportunity to partner with them on this chat. And so we're really excited yes. to be able to do that. And, you know, this is a, a time of Thanksgiving, so we're very thankful for them. And we're very yeah. Thankful for, you know, everybody that takes part. So we hope that you will take part. And I guess, Wendy, we'll, we'll spoil the, I don't think it's necessarily a surprise. <laughs> you know, not every year have we done a December chat. It really no. kind of depends on when it falls. Right. This year, though, because it is several days before Christmas mm -hmm. and, and travel schedules and such, we will be having a December chat. Yes. So more to come there. Excited to have this chat in a few days. And then we'll round out the year kind of a 2019 year interview, all the great stuff and all the things that we uh, should be thankful for and reflect on as we get ready for, can you believe it, 2020? No. Absolutely I know, I, insane. Uh, the Roaring 20s. Here we go. The Roaring 20s, <laughs> indeed. Well, Wendy, I have to say, I'm really excited about tonight's guest. Mm -hmm. we'll probably It will probably come up at some point. When I first met Sabrina, when we started talking, we found we had this weird connection because you know me and weird connections. Yeah. I seem to find them all the time. And, and so I had a chance to to visit with her quite a bit uh, earlier this year at Work Human, which was great. We had a chance to spend some time together at Embark as mm -hmm. well. And that was a lot of fun. I'm not going to gush anymore. I will let you make the introduction and we will get started. Yes. So excited to welcome Sabrina Baker to the show tonight and happy that we got a chance to connect uh, a little bit earlier this year at Embark. She is the founder of Acacia HR Solutions, an HR consulting firm headquartered in Los Angeles. While the firm offers a variety of services geared towards startups and small businesses, Sabrina spends her days providing training, leadership development, and team building workshops for clients across the country. Sabrina is certified in the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator and is fascinated with how personality type plays into our interactions in the workplace. She is also the co-founder of Disrupt HR Los Angeles, an information exchange designed to energize, inform, and empower people in the HR field. Sabrina, welcome to the show. We're so excited to have you. Tell us, what is in your glass? Oh, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I, you know, I rotate a little bit. I'm typically a gin and tonic girl, but I am from Kentucky, John, right? We have that, that connection. And so um, I've also been known to enjoy a suburban from time to time. I feel like being a Kentucky girl, you have to. So, you know, I, I kind of vacillate. It's still early in LA right now, so I just have water. But if I had a nice glass, it would definitely be uh, probably a gin and tonic or maybe an old fashioned. You and Sackett can enjoy those G and Ts, and yeah. you and I can enjoy that old fashioned the next time we see each other. And I, oh. you and my my little sister who is also you know, a Kentucky girl, she actually worked for Brown Foreman at one time. So she has a true appreciation for bourbon as well and actually did like learn how to taste it in the whole nine yards. It was really quite humorous when she did that. She did that as a college internship, believe it or not. Wow. Go figure. Fun. Go figure. Yeah. My husband, when we meet, meet new people, I'll order that. I know I'll order an old fashioned or something and, and everybody around the table just kind of look at me because I think it's unexpected. And then he'll be like, she's from Kentucky. So just <laughs> We certainly know what you're up to now, Sabrina, but. How exactly did you get your start in human resources? Well, I think like a lot of people, I fell into it. Um, I you know, went to college for general business management, and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I kept my major very general. I knew that I wanted to be in business somehow, but I really wasn't sure. Through my college career, I worked at a bank in uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky, where I went to the school. And I thought when I graduated that I would stay in banking. I, I liked it. I enjoyed it. I had built a pretty good um, network of people in that industry. And so 
when I graduated, I started applying for jobs and all in the banking industry. And I thought that's the direction that I was going to go. And then as I went to the interviews and I started talking to more people, I, I just, it just wasn't a fit. It just wasn't feeling right. Like I just thought I was going to be miserable being in the banking industry. And so one of the customers at the bank came in one day, she was asking me about my job search and how things were going. And I was three weeks from having to move back into my parents' house. And I was like, I don't want to do this. I do not want to move back home. Um, and she said, hey, my daughter works for um, a retail company in HR, looking for a generalist. Do you want me to send her your resume? And so uh, I said, yes, please. Uh, and that was um, literally probably, I think I got the call and the offer about it, three days before I was going to have to move. And that job was in Evansville, Indiana with a company called Shoe Carnival, which I know we're in. John, you may have heard of them. I know they're in the Midwest and the East Coast. I'm not sure. They're not uh, too much on the West Coast. But anyway, large retail organization. And I started just as a generalist, very entry level kind of generalist role. Um, And that was my first job in HR. And then it's just kind of grown from there. Um, I did nurse recruiting for a while. And then I worked for a call center company, which is crazy town um, working (laughs) for a call center. (laughs) Uh, absolute crazy town. I could write a book just on employee relations stuff that happens in a call center. Uh, and then, you know, started my own business. So kind of just fell into it. And then it's grown from there. Sabrina, I'm more than familiar with Carnival Shoes. I've bought many a pair of footwear there over the years. <laughs> Not for a long time, but back in college and high school. Oh, yeah. I knew Carnival very, very well. Yeah, they're uh, they're interesting. I think that's where we bought my uh, oldest daughter's first pair of shoes back when we were living in Virginia. So. Yeah. Awesome. Kind of, so Sabrina, you've recently mentioned that you, uh, or you just mentioned that you started your own consulting business. So talk about what went into that decision and how you found your niche. Um, as I said, I was working for a call center company. So my last seven years of corporate HR life was in this call center and I was a director of HR. I had five domestic and two international call centers that reported up through me. I was traveling all the time. Um, it was a very busy life. And in 2010, I went on maternity leave with uh, my first and only child. And uh, three weeks before I was supposed to return, my boss called to let me know that I was going to be laid off. And we, I, it's one of those things now, of course, hindsight is 2020. I probably should have seen it coming, but, you know, didn't. And so I was kind of shocked. And when I'm speaking and I'm talking to people about my story, I tell them that, you know, here I was with a three month old at home and a desire to work. I have a ton of respect for stay at home parents. It's just not in my DNA to be a stay at home parent. And so I wanted to work, but I did want to balance his life. And I wanted to be able to, to go to the school plays. And I wanted to, for my husband and I not to have to have this discussion when he was sick of whose turn is it to stay home and call in. And I just wanted to be able to really balance being with him, but working. And after um, taking a couple of months off, And doing some networking and soul soul searching and all of that, I realized if I was going to balance my schedule the way that I truly wanted to, I was going to have to branch out on my own. And so literally on a whim, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to start my own business. And I didn't even know. I I researched so many different businesses because I wasn't committed to the idea that I had to stay in HR. Like, could I start a eBay selling business? You know, I, I mean, I was just, I was looking at all kinds of things that would allow me to really focus my time to where I could work, but be with him. Uh, I happened to go to a networking event and sitting next to me was in my, I was living in Chicago at the time. And in the local community, there was a small business uh, center that helped local businesses get off the ground. And the uh, leader of that center was sitting next to me. And so she just started asking questions. And then she asked me what I was going to do. And I said, well, I'm kind of thinking of starting my own business. And she said, you know, all of your experience has been in large business. And I can't tell you how much small businesses need that experience and how much startups and, you know, they're just not thinking about some of the HR things that they could be thinking about now because they're small. And that's really how it got kicked off. And, and I decided officially in 2011 to start the business. And then it has kind of grown and evolved. I was working very part-time for the first couple of years because my son was home with me every day. And and so I had to work around a toddler schedule, which is, you know, always fun and exciting. Uh, and then as he has gone to school, obviously, I've been able to really dial it down to what we do, which is focus in on that super small. And when I say small, I mean, we have no threshold to entry. So we will work with 
companies that have just a founder and maybe two employees or um, typically up to around 500 employees. And so I, I just realize that it's an underserved market when you look at HR tech, when you look at uh, consulting firms, when you look at other people, they're looking at enterprise level. They want to work with the enterprises. And so these these startups, these small businesses, they have such a need for HR help um, and not a lot of options available to them. So it's kind of grown from there. Next year, we'll hit our 10-year anniversary. And um, I love it. I can't imagine doing anything else now. It's, you know, being an entrepreneur is crazy and, and up and down every single day, but it definitely has met my needs of being able to work, but then also balance life at home, which is really exciting. Sabrina, when you were working, especially when you find these very, very, and I'm going to say very small, when you're talking a founder and a couple of employees, do these folks seek you out? You know, in, in other words, it sounded like you know, there certainly are a lot of opportunities and people have the need. Do they know what they don't know? Does that make sense? They do not. And that, yeah. most of the time, that's what they say to me is they will come and, and sometimes it, it's very, very interesting. The, it depends on the relationship that they had with HR in the past. So if we're talking about a founder or a CEO who has maybe been in big business before or has been in smaller business, but that smaller business has had some kind of HR support, then they're a little bit more knowledgeable. But we certainly get, um, you know, our fair share of founders or, you know, very, very young business leaders who will come and say, look, I know HR is important. I know that, you know, scaling on the people side is important, but I don't know what I don't know. And I need you to tell me. And you know, what we really pride ourselves on is that we, we want to help them get past the compliance piece. So I'm in California, right? And, and so <laughs> compliance is, is nuts here. And it's very, very difficult to navigate as an employer. But really, we want startups and small businesses to think about how do we scale programs now at a, when you're small, it's easier to start thinking about employee engagement and culture and those things when you're small and then scale it as you grow. And so getting entrepreneurs, getting founders to think about those things is really, um, you know, they'll, they'll come to us for one reason, but then we're able to kind of open their eyes to what about all these other things that, you know, HR can do and that is important for your business as well. I think it's great to hear that people will acknowledge what they don't know. And, and hopefully they are coming with, I guess, a more positive approach or, or perspective when it comes to that. Let, let's kind of flip the script a little bit when it and, and talk more from the practitioner side. We did have the chance to see you present at Embark about basically the topic being stop asking for permission and, and really how as practitioners, how to become true business partners. So taking your experience from, from the big business and now what you've done working with these smaller companies, what advice or tips would you offer up to those folks that are listening that maybe they're at a point where they want to be, they're not seen as that true partner. They want to get there. What, what can you tell them tips or tricks they could do to, to do that? Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing is really in that title of that session, right? That I did at Embark. And that is um, that oftentimes what I find is that HR practitioners, they're waiting for permission. They are waiting for their CEO or their boss to walk into their office and say, hey, I now give you permission to be a business partner. I now give you permission to think strategically and to um, you know, create programs at a strategic level. I give you permission to get out of the day-to-day -day administration and to be and to act as a true business partner. And that's just not going to happen, right? That person is not going to walk in your office or your cubicle and say, okay, yesterday you didn't have permission, but today you have it. And so I encourage HR practitioners to really just be that leader and start acting like it, you know, start taking the, the reins on some of these things that you probably have the ability to do, but maybe you don't even realize it because you've never tried it. You think they're not seeing you as a business partner. So you don't try to suggest um, your ideas or you don't, you try not to, you don't work on the things that you want to work on because you assume that people are just going to knock it down anyway, but because you've never tried, you don't really know. And so I think part of it is a mindset. Part of it is we have to get out of this mindset that we're waiting for someone to pull out that chair uh, because they're never, they, they may never do that. They may never invite us in. We, we kind of have to take that on ourselves to say, hey, I'm here. I have ideas. I can contribute at a much higher level than just processing your payroll. Let me show you. And, and so I think that's, that's the biggest, the, the first step that we have to do is get past a, a mindset piece of it. I think that's true. I really agree with that. We need to just jump in and do it. But we're polite folk and we're wait, waiting for someone to, to say, it's okay. So I like that. Uh, I like what you shared. 
Yeah. And, you know, I think what happens is they're, they're, we're fearful that they're going to say no, or right. we're fearful that they're going to push back on us. And that can happen. Like, I'm not naive enough to think that there are workplaces that will be like, no, that's not what I want out of HR. But at least if that happens, you know, then that that's not the place for you, right? You, you know, then that this is a place that's never going to see me that way. So why do I continue to give them my, my time? My, you know, it's time for me to maybe find something else. And so, um, yeah, I think that, I mean, of course, there's more that goes into it, but I think the first step is just us getting past that fear of, um, or just getting past that we're too polite mm -hmm. and, and getting to the point where we can say, hey, I, I can contribute more here and I really want to do that. And, and so kind of along those lines, you're being a little disruptive um, and you've been very active in that. You brought Disrupt HR to LA, which is fantastic. Um, so you and I have that in common because I brought it to uh, my town, Brookings. So I, I'm always curious too, what's uh, got you interested in bringing Disrupt to LA and what's the benefit that you've seen? Yeah, so I have loved Disrupt since Jennifer started it. Um, you know, Jennifer and I have been connected for many, many years. And so I followed, as many people do, what she does and listen to everything she says. And when she started it in Ohio, I immediately saw the results or, and the feedback from that first event she had there. And, and the minute she started, you know, allowing other cities to look at it, I knew that I wanted to be a part of it. At the time I was in Chicago, we were in transition, getting ready to move to LA. So I had talked about maybe starting one in Chicago and then we found out we were going to move. And so I waited. And when I got here, I talked to her about starting an LA chapter and she said, well, we have one in Orange County. And normally there's a rule that you can't have, I think it's 65 yeah. miles. Maybe you can't have two disrupt within 65 miles. So I, I didn't know anything about Los Angeles and Orange County at the time. But if you two don't know anything, let me just tell you that people don't cross the <laughs> line. So they call it the orange curtain. And uh, even though we are literally, you know, right next door to one another, people from LA don't go into Orange County and people from Orange County do not drive up to LA. And so after the first one in OC, I called her and I said, we can absolutely have our own chapter in Los Angeles. Please let, let's do this. Um, and so that started in 2015. We just had our sixth one in October and I absolutely love it. And I love it for a couple of reasons. One, I love the format, the five minute you know, 20 slides at auto advance. I think it, it's kind of like a performance. I tell people all the time, I've been speaking for years and disrupt HR talks are the ones that I practice the most because that timing is so mm -hmm. crucial mm -hmm. uh, and can really mess you up if you get off of it. But I love that no topic is taboo. And I think that, I, you know, I go to a lot of industry events, a lot of conferences, and sometimes we have to really play it safe. And, and we can't really talk about some of the tough topics that are happening every single day in our workplaces because um, we, you know, we need to be a little bit more politically correct maybe in some of these, some of these events. And so I love that with disrupt, it's absolutely, you know, no topic is um, out there and, you know, any topic can be discussed and, and people seem to really be able to bring like, here's truly what I'm facing in the workplace. Here's the really difficult stuff that I'm facing. Let's, Let's talk through it. Um, and so I think the benefit has just been bringing some of those topics to light and, and talking through, even in that quick five-minute format, what people are doing around those things. I think with the five-minute format, you get just enough to tickle your brain a little bit, yeah. right? Like it's not a whole hour and a half session where you get all these like five-step plans. It's five minutes that if the speaker does their job well, you're able to walk away and really be thinking about it and kind of process what they're saying and, and apply it to your own situation. And so I, I'm a big fan. I tell people wherever I go, like if you have a disrupt in your city, you need to go yep. um, because it's just different than any other event. And I, I, I find that I get the most out of those little quick hit talks than I do out of some of the longer talks at other events. It's spoiled me. I can't sit through the 45 minute, 75 minute sessions anymore. <laughs> like, no, come on. Get to the point. Yeah. Next topic. Next topic. Next topic. But no, mm -hmm. I agree with you. You're, you're, there's a little bit more freedom in the disrupt talks to address some of those some of those issues that we you're not going to address in a 75 minute session. Kudos to you for bringing that to yeah. uh, that to LA. I'm sure if it was needed here, it was needed there. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was needed here. Our first one, everybody kept coming up after saying, "Oh my gosh, this is so needed. Um, it's so fantastic." And we we get a really a good response. Um, and, you know, we've had amazing speakers. So I love it. It's an event that I will continue to do for as long as I can. 
Sabrina, it is now time for everyone's favorite part of our show, the Half Hour Question Connection. So we always start with who is your first professional mentor and what was the most important thing you learned from them? So my first professional mentor was uh, when I moved out of my first generalist job, I moved into a nurse recruiting job in Chicago for a large hospital system that had about 125,000 employees. And at that time, I'm going to date myself, but at that time, nurse recruiting, there was a, a massive shortage in nurses, massive. And nurse recruiting was uh, like the tech recruiting of today. I mean, it was really, really difficult to find nurses. It was extremely competitive. And in a big city like Chicago, you had large hospitals that were literally giving away cars for nurses if they would come and, and join there because it was so competitive. My boss in that role was a uh, nurse practitioner. She had been in the nursing field her whole career. And she was what I call a silver tongued devil. Um, she could give you, you know, she could have any conversation. First of all, she could find a way to say anything and she could give the, the most horrible news that you never wanted to hear, but you would end up like hugging her after, you know, or she could give you a tongue lashing, like really just be so disappointed and telling you something that you did wrong, giving you some very aggressive feedback, but do it in a way that you weren't angry after you didn't feel defeated. You know, it was really kind of motivational. And so I, uh, after working for her for just a couple of months, went in and said, I have to know how you do this. I have to know how, when everybody else is screaming in the room, you with your voice, bring them all down. And so she was amazing. Um, and our fields were so different because she had been in nursing, which was so different than, you know, really HR. And, and she had just come into this nurse recruiting role, but not as an HR person, as a nurse trying to understand nurses. And so all of the way that I communicate, the way that I work with employees, the way that I diffuse, obviously in HR, we have a lot of diffusing we have to do. So the way that I diffuse uh, situations was learned from her. And it was it's kind of a natural thing for her. It's just something that's just the way that she was, but she was really able to help articulate for me, a young girl at the time trying to navigate all this, how you do that. How do you, when you're dealing with, you know, leaders above you who are angry and, you know, how do you calm them down? When you have to give constructive feedback. How do you do that? So uh, her name is Karen Barnes. I'll never forget her. She was uh, amazing and really um, helped craft the whole way that I communicate and talk today. Sabrina, who's one person you've gained in your network in the last year that you think more people should know? One person is difficult, um, but if I had to pick one, well, actually, I'm probably going to give you two just because they're working together now. But the first one is uh, Tara Turk Haynes, and she actually works for a client of mine, Leaf Group, um, and she's on Twitter at T Tara Turk, I think. Um, but she is now working with Heidi Pancake, who I think you guys know. They, both of them, I met through Disrupt. Heidi, I met almost when I first moved here, but but we kind of orbited circles. I'm sure you guys can relate to this. We kind of would go to events and we'd both be there, but not necessarily interact much. And then in the last year through my relationship with Leaf Group and Tara as a client, then I've spent more time with both Tara and Heidi. And they're amazing. Both of them, just so much energy, so much courage in the way that they lead and the way that they talk and the way that they kind of navigate this HR life. And so those are my my two. They're both on Twitter and uh, absolutely amazing. So Sabrina, if you could go back to the start of your career, what's one piece of advice you would give yourself? Oh, you know, I think I would tell myself to chill out. I, I am sure that I took myself way too seriously. I took HR way too seriously. You know, I think I was probably one of those no people all the time. No, we can't do this. It's illegal. And, you know, we're going to get sued. And I think I just took things so serious. I've always been really super ambitious and, and because of that, super afraid to mess up um, or afraid to derail my career, or, you know, just always thought something catastrophic was going to happen. And so I, I really kind of overworked myself and took things just way more seriously than I needed to and, and, and still find myself doing it. I still have to tell myself to chill out even now, but definitely early on, I would just tell myself to calm down, chill out. It's going to be fine. You don't have to be so serious all the time. You can lighten up and have a little fun, even if you are the HR person. Sabrina, beyond Disrupt, how else do you enjoy giving back to the HR community? So I love being a part of events. So Embark is a great example, speaking at events um, and, and hosting events. So Disrupt is obviously one we've talked about. Next year, I'm also going to be hosting in LA uh, some roundtables, HR hackathon we're doing. 
Um, so I, I just love if learning events. I think that I'm an avid reader and avid, always trying to learn new things. And I think that that's so important for everybody. And so I love putting on events, organizing events that people can come and learn from and, and really be able to take back to their organization and, and do something with. Anytime that I can either be a part of an event where I can maybe contribute to the learning or of course, learn myself, or I can actually host the event, put it together um, and then bring in amazing speakers to help attendees learn something. That's uh, something that I love to do. I need to know more about this HR hackathon. What is that? Yeah. So it was started in um, Chicago. And of course, the the um, lady's name is going to escape me now, but it is kind of similar to Disrupt. So it started in Chicago and it is an event where you can, so you could have one in your city. Uh, you uh, go to an actual employer. This is the idea the situation is you would go to an actual employer and they present a problem that they are facing. So a real life problem. You host the event, um, hopefully at their location. And then you work through design thinking principles kind of to hack this problem. So attendees, maybe 30, 50 attendees will come in and you'll have a a moderator who is asking them questions to kind of help them work through a design thinking mentality of how can we offer suggestions to actually solve this problem? And so you spend the hour, whatever time it is, kind of just hacking that one issue that that real company that you're at is facing. And then at the end, you come together and, you know, kind of offer up the suggestions and work through what might work to be able to to solve this. And, and it can be anything we haven't done one here in LA. But uh, my understanding is that the problem can really be anything, you know, people related. So it can be engagement issues, culture issues, communication issues, whatever that is. Um, So I'm really excited to, to have that here next year and to be a part of that. And I think it's it's such a different, you know, disrupt is so different. And then I think also this HR hackathon is going to be com- completely different as well. So that sounds like fun. Awesome. So I hope you'll share lots on that because it'll be interesting to see um, the outcome. I'm very curious about it. Sabrina, what is your favorite movie? Oh, my goodness. So by default, by marriage default, my favorite movie has to be Good- Goodfellas. Uh, my husband's from Chicago and, you know, I was always fascinated with mafia. I don't, I don't watch a lot of movies, so I don't know that I, I really have a favorite, but that's the one that when you, <laughs> when I saw this question, I thought it has to be good because that's what I've had to watch since I got married is, is Goodfellas every single time it's on the TV. How about your favorite musician or band? Uh, you know who I'm really into right now is oh, Pentatonix or any kind of acapella. Like I have just been on this thing for the last couple of years where um, I, really my music is all over the place. My husband's the baby of eight children. So being that his, his musical interest spans all kinds of decades. And that's what we end up listening to is all over the place, literally. But for me, if I have control here, then it would be like acapella or anything, anybody that does different, like takes a song and then completely switches the style of music. I recently saw, uh, I can't remember the group, but Wayne Brady's song thriller, uh, like jazz style with tap dancers and, you know, like Michael Jackson's Thriller and switched it up to to be, it was so cool. So I love anything like that. Um, but yeah, acapella, I'd say, I'd say pentatonics. I saw them last year at the Hollywood Bowl, which is was amazing. Uh, kind of an open air theater here. So I'm, I'm digging them lately. Cool. How about a favorite TV show? So probably Friends. That's the one that it's almost like my white noise. That's what I have on all the the background all the time. You know, it, it started when I was starting in college. So it was a perfect kind of fit for me. That's uh, what I seem to be the that seems to be the show that I watch over and over and, you know, from start to finish. Uh, if you asked my family, they would tell you it would be something like Snapped or some kind of true crime. I don't know if you guys know what Snapped is, but it's like true crime of like women who have lost their minds and gone after their husbands. So uh, my husband gets a little worried all the time because that's always on the TV. So he thinks I'm trying to get ideas, but <laughs> yeah, I'd say the one that I come back to all the time is, is probably friends. Sabrina, I think it's safe to say we've never had anybody say they've had a favorite movie by default. I think that's new. <laughs> I think the Wayne Brady song you're thinking of is, is it postmodern jukebox? Probably who it yes. is. Cause they, those yes. folks are incredibly talented and right. A lot of cool stuff. I think we, if you're looking for a friend's podcast, Heather Dariu, who's the president of HR Florida, has a tremendous podcast. I'll plug a, a non-HR show called uh, Handbag Marinara, which is awesome. Wendy's listened to it, too. It's very entertaining. 
and I think you're also the first person that's ever talked about the fact you watch a crime show that somebody thinks you may be trying to consider what you're going to do with it, that which is a little disheartening. I'm not going to lie. Isn't that funny? Every time he walks in the house, he's like, he tells his friends all the time. He's like, I swear she's plotting something because every time I walk in the house, she's watching Snaps. And yeah, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm just fascinated. I am fascinated by the fact that people can lose their minds that much and do that. Like it just blows my mind, but he really thinks I'm plotting. Well, well, that, that's going to lead me to my next question. If you're if you're not watching Goodfellas, not listening to Pentatonics or watching Friends or Snapped, what else do you like to do outside of work? And please don't say trying to plot some kind of horrible thing. Yeah, no. Um, so I love cycling. That's kind of my way. I'm an introvert, and that is my introvert time is going out and cycling. I live in LA, so we have this gorgeous weather and gorgeous landscape to be able to to get out on a bike and ride for hours. Um, and then I have a very, very busy nine-year-old. So he's into theater and has decided he wants to be an actor. So he's doing plays and singing lessons and all kinds of things. So if I'm not running him somewhere, I am probably riding my bike. So finally, Sabrina, if you weren't in the HR profession, what do you think you'd be doing? You know, my whole life, since I was a little girl, what I wanted to do was uh, be a lawyer. I really thought that I was going to be a lawyer. And all through high school, I mean, that was kind of, you know, grades and, and all of that stuff. And then I realized that getting into a school where I could go to law school was going to be more difficult than I thought, both just from a, a, a grades perspective, but also financially. And then when I got into college, I was like, no, I just want to get out of this and be done. I don't think I can keep going to, to go to law school. Um, so I didn't. But I, I think that if I if I weren't in HR and had I really kind of followed what I thought I was going to do my whole life, I would definitely be a lawyer. Well, Sabrina, we're glad you're not practicing law. We maybe would have connected potentially. You know, we do have some employment attorneys on this show. But if you weren't doing what you were doing now, we probably wouldn't know you. We probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to talk to you tonight incredibly glad that we've had this time and that we had a chance to find these weird connections. And yes, uh, we didn't really talk about it too much, but your alma mater is where both my parents went to school, which again, nutty, right? In this big picture of, of life. Having said all that, probably some listeners that don't know you or haven't, didn't know you before now that will want to get connected. What's the best way for them to reach you out there on social media? Yeah, I think the best way is through the website because we have all of the social links. So AcaciaHRSolutions.com is the website and it has the links to Twitter and LinkedIn and you know wherever else you can find us. There's the blog and all of those good things. So that's probably the best, the easiest way, one stop to, to go and connect on all the other places. We will have that in the show notes for sure. Wendy, how about you? For the listeners that uh, aren't connected, what's the best way for them to find you out there? The best way is on my blog, mydailyjourney.com. Daily is D as in dog, A-I-L-E-Y. And of course, fourth Sunday of each month, this this coming Sunday, if you're listening when this comes out, is our monthly Twitter chat, 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So join us on Twitter with the hashtag HR Social Hour. How about you, John? HR Social Hour podcast.podbean.com. You go there and click on the left hand side at the top side of the screen. Three little lines open them up, has access to all my social accounts there. While you're there, if there's an episode you haven't listened to, download, listen, rate, review. If you're not listening directly through the Podbean app, go to iTunes or wherever you may be and leave us a review. It helps us so much. It helps boost our signal and, and, and get us rank, pushed up in the rankings. The more reviews and the more the more five stars and the, all the good stuff you can do, we always appreciate. Again, Sabrina, really, really glad you're able to join us tonight. So for the HR Social Hour Half Hour Podcast, I'm John. And I'm Wendy. And as always, be sure to connect, give back, and network. network. Take care, everybody. Well, we'll see you soon. 